Well, good morning to you, my friends, on this first Sunday in the month of August. Certainly the temperatures outside are reminding us that we are in the dog days of summer, if you will. Uh, but it's a pleasure to spend even just this little bit of time with you online on Sunday morning. Uh, so grateful for a chance to be in your homes um, or wherever you might be viewing this. Um, it certainly is a privilege that I, I don't take lightly as we continue to forge ahead and uh, keep our community going the very best way we can uh, in these continually trying times. Um, I know that you are praying for each other, you are encouraging each other, uh, and I, I, I wanna just kinda push you to keep doing that, to keep reaching out, to, to check on people, to text, to call, to send an email, uh, to write a postcard, uh, because we need to, as a community of people, check on each other to make sure that we are doing well um, and that we are kinda moving our way forward because we are better together. We've just got to work a little extra hard uh, to make sure that together continues to happen. Um, this Sunday morning, we are continuing in our series, Encounters with Christ. I'm looking forward to this, um, as I am every week, but this week talking about newness of faith and what does that look like when we have some room to grow. Uh, so I want to encourage you to continue to grow, that even in this season that is unlike any other that we've certainly experienced before, the opportunities are still there for us to develop our faith, to continue to to trust, to continue to grow, to, to become the people that God has designed us to be. And I hope that this is a piece of that. I want to remind you again that to continue these spiritual practices that are important to you, to, to take communion and find that time to create those special moments within your home for you to take part in that. And then if you choose to give of an offering, you can certainly mail a check to the church um, or you can give on the online link, which is on our website up at the top uh, or the link that we'll post below in the comments for those that are interested in that. And let me just say thank you to those that have faithfully continued to support. That is a very gracious of you. I know that these are some trying economic times as well for many people. And we're certainly thankful as we continue to make our way forward. So uh, looking forward to spending Sunday morning with you. Um, and uh, blessings to you, my friends. When I was growing up as a young man in Florida, we didn't always have a lot as a family. And we had a, my mom was hardworking, was doing everything she could, but we just didn't always have a lot of things. So one of the benefits to us, one of the, the helpful things for us was the generosity of other people. And that I would get a lot of hand-me-down clothes. That, you know, somebody had an older son and they would pass it down. Maybe they were a couple of years older than me um, and the clothes were gently worn and they felt like, hey, this may be beneficial uh, to Craig and his family. And that was very good. It also meant that I didn't get a lot of new things. You know, and I just kind of knew that that was going to be the case. The, the problem was when you had a growth spurt that those hand-me-downs just had to do. And sometimes that meant that you were, you know, you're wearing holes in the knees of things a little earlier than they would have earlier. And, and perhaps maybe the hem was coming up on your, band, your pants a little bit. Uh, maybe the waistband was a little more snug than you wanted it to be. This, and when that growth spurt happened, things didn't quite fit the same way that they did before. Well, what do we do when our faith grows? Is, I think sometimes that happens, right? At least I, I hope that happens for each of us, that, that what we believe grows, our understanding grows a little bit. And, and then the question is, can, do we think we can still operate in that old system or do we have to look for something new? Because what I believe is that as our understanding of who God is increases, as our, as our faith grows, as we mature as followers of Christ, that the way things used to fit don't fit quite as well anymore. And that the better way for us is to make some adjustments. Because the expansion of our faith is encouraged. We need to look for different ways to think. We need to look for different ways to engage. That's the only way that this becomes a journey. If we're not willing to grow, then what we may end up doing is describing that we may have, for example, 20 years of faith. But what we don't really have is 20 years of faith. We have one year of faith repeated 20 times because nothing has changed. And I think that God is calling us to change. I think God shows us bits and pieces as we go, as we're willing to engage us, as we're willing to expand our thinking and our understanding. And as we'll see today in the passage that we're gonna look at, encountering Christ gives us the freedom 
to grow in faith. That encountering Christ gives us the freedom to grow in faith. And in Luke chapter 5, verses 33 to 39, we see this interaction with Jesus where he's sitting with his disciples, spending time with them, and these Pharisees, these, these leaders that are constantly challenging Christ and his followers, approach him. And in verse 33 of Luke chapter 5, we see their interaction take place. They, talking about these leaders, they said to him, well, John's disciples often fast and pray, and so do the, the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours go on eating and drinking. And Jesus answered, can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. In those days, they will fast. He told them this parable. No one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise, they will have torn the new garment and the patch from the new will not match the old. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wine skins. And no one after drinking old wine wants the new, for they say the old is better. Now Jesus is saying a whole lot as he always does in a very short couple of sentences. But, but what we're seeing initially is that these leaders are trying to stir up dissension. They're trying to come in and point some things out there, nudging in, trying to create some unrest. But what's happening is that Jesus is bringing in new ways of living, and the leaders are uncomfortable with that. See, they, they've established their system. They've established their traditions, and they don't want to look at things differently. They, they don't want to think about things differently. So they're questioning this, but instead of sitting down with Jesus and saying, hey, help us understand, they come in accusing. But I really do believe that for us to mature in this Christian walk, We've got to learn to expand our thoughts and beliefs beyond some of those former boundaries of faith. Because I think that we can gain that new understanding the more we seek it. And new ways of faith, as we see with the disciples right here, new ways of faith lead to new practices. But I, I want to encourage you right away. Don't be defined by someone else's faith. That, that's exactly what's taking place in this passage. Is that these leaders are coming in trying to compare their faith and the faith of John's disciples with the faith of the disciples of Christ. If you go back into verse 33, it says, hey, John's disciples often fast and pray. So do, so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours go on eating and drinking. And, and, you know, they're not just comparing spiritual practices in this. It's kind of a condescending tone. It's, well, we are better at this than you are. Check us out. See the things that we do. See the, the, the things that we practice. And look how you go about it. I mean, it really is this kind of looking down their nose at somebody else. Trying to, to diminish and demean because there's a difference in the way they choose to practice it. Verse 33 from the message says that John's disciples were well known for their fasting and praying. Well known. That's, that was their reputation. I, I don't know. It just it kind of had me thinking about the reputation of those that follow the path of Christ. Is it just centered on the practices that they do as part of their faith? And now please don't misconstrue. That actions are important, right? Faith without works is dead. That it can't just be about us saying, well, I believe this without actually doing it to show that we believe it. But, but I wonder if the greatest part of the reputation is more about the things that people do for themselves or how they live out that faith in a way that benefits those around them. The Pharisees were caught up in this personal, spiritual practices. And that's where they chose to hone in instead of noticing the other things that were taking place. And sometimes we can do the external practices without having a heart that's right. 
We, we've talked about that many times, that there's, there's got to be this symbiotic relationship between the internal and the external. And our outward acts should correspond to a healthy inward condition. And it's when those two come together that then, yes, we do the things we need to do for us to maintain our focus, but we do it in a way that also benefits the community of people around us. Because the Pharisees, they, they took this whole idea of fasting to a whole other level, but they didn't do it because they felt like there was this deeper need for spiritual connection. They wanted to say, well, if you're going to fast twice, we're going to fast four times so that we appear twice as holy as you. It really was all about appearances. And then they could spend time pointing out the sins of other people, right? Well, I do this and I go here and I read this and I pray this. And let me just point out because of how holy and righteous I am, let me point out the things that you're doing wrong in your life. And they're missing it. See, just looking at the outward doesn't always reflect the inward condition. I, I bought a car, new to me, a used car, in March. Um, it was time for a vehicle. I needed something. So I spent a lot of time online, just trying to find a decent deal, looking at different cars. I probably spent two or three weeks just looking at things. I didn't buy the car that I found online, sight unseen, however, because even though I got a good look, and you know, you know they showed me pictures of the interior and pictures of the engine, I wanted to actually be there. I wanted to drive it. I wanted to be in the car. I wanted to see how the car performed because it couldn't just be about the external picture, right? And I told you that's how I bought it. You'd say, well, then you're a fool. You need to drive it before you just buy it. Well, our faith is similar. It can't just be about the external practices. There has to be a focus on the heart that leads us in the right direction. So I'm going to encourage you not compare your faith to your neighbor, but to just examine yourself, to evaluate your own life with Holy Spirit guidance, to determine what is best for you as you move forward. Because while the Pharisees were trying to impose certain things, I want you to see the pathway Jesus took. He wasn't imposing extra restrictions. Instead, he was offering extra grace. That's the difference of the heart. And, and I think once we get comfortable with not comparing our faith to the faith of other people around us, that we can start to look for new ways to grow and to do it in the right way season. If you go back into this text, you see in verse 36, Jesus says, no one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one. Otherwise, they will have torn the new garment and the patch from the new will not match the old. He, now he's speaking some common sense. This is what he's saying because he gives them this practical example and everybody's nodding. Yes, why would you do that? You would tear something out of a new one to patch something that's old that wouldn't make sense. So he's, he's trying to speak that common sense over them, but he's also making a point that the old needs to be changed to make room for the new. If you do it the other way around, you find that both are ineffective. So again, if you, if you tear a piece of something new out to fix something old, you still haven't fixed the old, and now you've ruined the new. And what Jesus is trying to get them to understand from a faith perspective is that we've got to make room for the new things in our life. And that sometimes we've got to step away from that old system to make it work. In verse 37, he talks about wine. No one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. I think what he's trying to say is there's an incompatible mix if you try and take new wine, put it in old wine skins. And he's trying to tell us if you've got a new way of thinking, you try and fit it into an old paradigm, it doesn't always match up. And what happens is that new system gets corrupted and falls apart. The wine skin bursts and then the wine runs out on the ground. So essentially you've lost both. You've wasted new potential, but you've also thrown away the value of old ways. See, Jesus isn't telling them, don't fast. He isn't telling them, don't pray. He's saying, look for new ways to do things in the right season. And then we've got to learn to make space within ourselves 
to make space within our church, to make space within our community for new ways to grow. The challenges that we face as people are constantly changing. And sometimes we've got to change our approach to lead us in a healthy direction. What Jesus was doing here, he was calling for change. He was looking for a new order of things. So what new things can be developed in our faith? What, what new things can be developed about the way that we think about other people? What new things can be developed in the way that we even perceive ourselves and recognize some things in ourselves that we've held to be true for a really long period of time, but now they need to change. They need to be transformed, which is an ongoing process of how God does things. Right? You, you can't just reach that point, which step into the door and think, well, I'm done, I'm good, I'm covered. That's kind of like going to the gym and stepping inside the door of the gym or maybe doing one workout out the gym and thinking, all right, I'm good from now on. Well, we would be foolish to think that way about our physical health. Why are we okay with that from a spiritual perspective? See, God wants us to change and grow. He's encouraging us to push beyond. But I'm not telling you to abandon everything. I am, obviously, we don't have cable at our house, but when we go on vacation, we'll end up getting caught up sometimes at night sitting around with our girls watching HGTV. Um, I'm a sucker for like a rebuilding show, you know, like Property Brothers or uh, flip it or, or flip it or sell it. I can't remember what they're all called. Uh, but anyway, but the, I love when the people go in and they start to change these houses. And one of the phrases that they'll say very often when somebody buys something to, to improve the interior is they'll say, the house has good bones. And, and what they're saying is, listen, there are some things that need to be fixed. You might need to fix this floor. We certainly need to change some light fixtures. And uh, the, the thing you hear all the time when you watch these shows, we'd love an open concept for entertaining. But when they talk about the good bonds, they're saying, listen, the foundation is solid. That there are pieces of this house that don't need to be changed. And while we can make some alterations in traffic patterns and where windows are, you keep the bones of the house because they're good. Yeah, I think that's supposed to define our faith. That we hang on to the core essential things that are so key to what we believe and how we believe it. But there are different ways to go about living out that faith. There are different ways to structure the songs we sing and the, and the interactions we have with people and our perspective on our community, the way that we view other people, I think all of those things can be adjusted. You keep your core beliefs. You understand who God is, our relationship to Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit within us, the pathway of salvation that that's provided for us, but sometimes we get caught up in the little things and think those can't be changed when really God says, hang on to the things that matter most. And as you grow, be willing to seek understanding, new understanding. Because in all of this, Jesus is emphasizing the way of grace. And then I'm going to encourage you, as I think Jesus is encouraging us, to savor the experience of developing our faith. In verse 39, Jesus says, And no one after drinking old wine wants the new, for they say the old is better. And you're thinking, but didn't he just talk about we need new things and new wine, but nobody wants to drink the old? There's a maturing process that needs to take place even as we continue to think new things. Age and wisdom helps us gain understanding, or at least it should. And we need our faith to continue to mature. Simple principles of wine. Wine increases in strength and flavor with age. It increases in the mildness and mellowness with age. And it actually becomes preferable. But it's a process of allowing it to develop. And that as it develops, and I think this specifically applies to walking the Christian pathway, 
savor the experience as it takes place. Because the Christian life needs its own forms of development. It needs its, its own actions of newness and that we can enjoy the process as it goes. See, learners in life are marked by great receptivity, that there is an awareness, a recognition in them that they have much to learn and they're willing to learn. They're willing to look at things new, to look at themselves new. And Jesus is encouraging that we show consideration to those that get that concept. Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, listen, these guys are growing as they go, that they're moving forward as they can. And we're going to give them the space to do that. So I'm going to encourage each of you to just enjoy the journey. Enjoy where you are right now, but to learn to let other people move at their own pace as well. There's all of us process things differently. All of us come into this experience with different historical backgrounds, with, with different family backgrounds, with, with different things happening to us, different choices that we have made. And they influence the way that we perceive things. So show extra grace. Show extra grace to the people that you encounter, those that, that you may not even see, but you may hear about in our community, and, and also show extra grace to yourself. And I'm going to encourage you to enjoy the season you are in right now. And, and I've said this phrase several times before, I'm gonna say it again. Encourage yourself by telling yourself that the faith that you have is enough for right now. The faith you have is enough for right now. Because what the disciples were showing us is that they knew how to be in the moment. That's one of the things Jesus was trying to tell these other people. Listen, you, you've got to recognize what's right in front of you. And they recognize that I'm here with them. That this moment right now doesn't call for fasting. This moment calls for celebration. And I think Jesus tells us the same thing. Recognize the season and see the joy that can be right in front of you and spend time in that joy. You know, times of transition are critical. And, and Christ in this passage is ushering everybody forward into a new era, a new way of thinking about things grasping this extra grace and a willingness to learn and engage. In fact, I would say that the greatest sign of maturity and wisdom is not the person who thinks they've got it all figured out, but the person who knows that they don't have it all figured out. And I think that we can all together say, hey, let's, let's move forward. All of us at our different pace, but all of us moving in the same direction. You've heard me say this as well. Are we like-minded and like-hearted enough to move together knowing that we won't all be in the same clump because we're moving at a different pace, but we're moving in the same direction. That's what Christ is calling us to. So I, I think we've got to ask ourselves, are we receptive to new ways of thinking? Even thinking about the teachings of Jesus, even thinking about the purpose of the church, thinking about the community of folks around us, and then we've got to ask another question of ourselves, why? Am I receptive to that or why not? And then if I really believe that encountering Christ gives us freedom to grow in faith, then I need to be growing in my faith and recognize I have that freedom. That that's not always an easy process to set aside some things we've always held on to. But can we do that to move forward to reach a new awareness, a new spiritual understanding? And then let Christ determine the validity of our spiritual practices and not other people, not other followers of faith, not other churches, to let Christ determine the validity of our spiritual practices based on how we're growing in him. Encountering Christ gives us freedom to grow in faith. How will you look to grow, my friends? What are you willing to examine and to understand that God gives you that freedom to ask that question to move forward in a brand new way. 
you know, we hear constantly as we talk about the, the COVID-19 experience, we say, we want to return to normal. And the people say, well, or at least get back to a new normal. I, I don't think that's any different than what life has always been for us. There are always challenges. There are always alterations to our expectations. There are always obstacles to be overcome when we try and push forward and, and seek the way of Christ for our community and the people around us. But instead of sitting back and demanding that other people change and grow, how are we as individuals going to choose to grow? Because when we are willing to do that, then that will move beyond just us and start to influence the sphere of people in our community. Grow in that way, my friends. Know that God gives you the freedom to do so. In fact, encourages you to do so. And I believe it is a true indicator of a follower of the pathway of Christ. I miss you all. I do. I miss seeing your faces. Um, we have an opportunity to teach and share in these things to continue to grow. We'll do the best we can as we keep moving forward in this way. Uh, let me pray for each of you as we close. Uh, Divine Creator, I, I am just deeply in touch with the hearts of the people that I know are watching this. And, and I, I ask that you would fulfill their needs, that you would meet their needs spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically. And that God, as we struggle with not being engaged in the strength of face-to-face -face community that we're so used to, may we instead find our fulfillment in you. And would you open up our eyes to new ways of thinking, new ways of practicing our faith, new ways of engaging with each other to know that we have the freedom to change those things, even though that change might seem uncomfortable at first. But would you give us the courage and comfort that we need to continue to push forward on our pathway of following you? We ask for your blessings on all of us, and we know that you hear us better than we are speaking. And we pray this in all the holy names of God. Amen. Peace and grace to you, my friends. Be excellent to each other. Be excellent to yourself.